uh, final panelist in this session. Uh, the speaker is uh, Anil Mankar from BrainShip, and he will be talking to us about uh, their new processor that uses spiking neural network technology. So sorry for the delay, and welcome, Anil. Thanks, Mike. Uh, I'm uh, going to talk about Akira, a neuromorphic processor that is really designed for power efficient AGI applications. So when you do actually want to do AI applications, uh, AI inference at the edge, edge device, you have to satisfy two competing requirements. One is the real time performance of the sensor that you are trying to analyze and fit it in a low power budget. And also you have to do the operations within the strict constraints on memory, the memory bandwidth and the compute. Our standard, uh, deep learning accelerators uh, do uh, try to overcome these challenges by trying to either do changing the network by pruning them or take advantage of weight sparsity, like uh, Lin Lin uh, mentioned about Ampere, trying to do uh, look at the weights, analyze the weights, and see where the uh, zeros are, and trying to avoid multiplication by zeros. Or some deep learning accelerators also do weight compression for storage. So they can, uh, but you have to again decompress the, the storage weights before you do computation. So all of those operations trying to reduce the number of max uh, operations or the weights or the memory involve more computations. Uh, but uh, what Akira does is we actually take a neuromorphic approach where we take the, we take the computations into event domain. And in, by that, uh, what happens is we take advantage of both the weight sparsity and the activation sparsity without having to do any analysis of where the zero weights are or where the activation sparsity is. We also take another step where we take the memory, uh, that's a, a memory computation and reduce the memory to four bit, two bits or one bit. So what we have done is by going into event domain, we have reduced the memory footprint requirement, the memory bandwidth requirement and the compute requirement of the inference at the edge all that lead to the low power implementation of the, the solution. So we for, uh, for that, Akira follows neuromorphic design principles, which are basically first principle is to, you should distribute all the computation. So the computation is spread across multiple, uh, what we call neural processing unique NPUs. And each NPU is self-sufficient in that it has its own memory and computation engine. So it's, it, it can really reduce data movement and it can do the computation required uh, for doing the inference. When you have a CNN or a network that has multiple layers, you can take all the computation that are required ac uh, across the multiple layers and distribute them to available number of CPU. Second thing is event-based processing. Event-based processing means you only do perform computations on the events, which are basically nothing but non-zero non activation map values, which are represented as one or, or four bit events. So because of that, there is no need to really look and uh, because the event-based computation happens both for taking advantage of weights and activation. So you don't have to do extra calculations to see where the zeros might be. And while you can do that on, on your weights, you cannot really do that in activation because in every frame, that number activation changes. But uh, doing event-based processing allows you to take advantage of both sparsity in activation and sparsity in weights. The third thing is communication of the events. So each of the NPUs can communicate the events it generates while doing the computation to the next layer NPUs or a mesh network. So you don't really need a CPU to intervene and see what the intermediate results were from one layer and communicate that to the next layer, the mesh network of NPUs does it itself. The, the, the actual network connectivity is configured where, so when depending on what kind of networks you're running, you can configure the layer connectivity, program the mesh, and all the NPUs now can actually execute the complete neural network starting from layer one to in the last layer as much as possible on, on all the computation being done within the, uh, within the hardware and the configurable, configurable network. Uh, so the complete network is, is actually executed on the hardware. Because we do computations in event domain, we can actually use the event-based learning uh, that allows us to really add some incremental learning or one-shot learning without having to go back to the cloud 
we will add new new classification to the network. So what is the NP you have? Each of the NP has about 100 kilobytes of memory that is configurable depending on the IP configuration that actually stores the parameters and activations, the weights, and, and internal event buffers. Each of the NPU has eight compute engines that run in parallel, and they actually get a packet of events coming in, uh, process them, and at the end, end of the processing of the packet, generate output events that can be again go, go back onto the mesh network. And each NPU has a learning hardware also that can be turned on or off. All of these uh, NPUs, four of the NPUs make one node, as you saw in the picture. So that four NPUs can communicate within uh, within their uh, smaller uh, mesh network, and the node communicate over a larger mesh network. Uh, this is an example of a, a 20 node uh, diagram that we're showing. And each NPU can be processed to either do 2D convolutions, or you can also do completely fully connected layers, uh, all, all, on the, all in the hardware. Typically, what are the advantage of doing event-based computation? So let's take an example of a typical frame-based convolution where you have a five by five activation map and you are trying to take a three, a three by three kernel and trying to go over the five by five input frame-based activation map. In a standard frame-based convolution, because you don't know where the geos might be in, in, in your activation map, you have to go across all the five by five and perform about 225 MAC operations to get the results of, uh, of the convolution. While in event-based convolution, you can take the same activation map and only where there are uh, non-zero events, which are shown here by green, red, and blue, where you will actually be positioning your uh, kernel over those events and do only 27 max as the result of the, uh, of the convolution is actually same, but you have done fewer max. Of course, the more zeros you have in your input activation, you benefit. So naturally, architecturally, by going into event-based convolution, you have taken advantage of both the zeros in the weights and zeros in activation map without having to worry about calculating where the zeros might be. So the architecture, uh, architecturally, we actually reduce the total number of operations that are required for doing the inference. Now, uh, let's talk about activation paucity. Uh, typically, whenever you do a convolution on an input frame, you definitely get uh, standard uh, applying a value functions to the activation map and doing batch normalization. Naturally, you get a 40 to 50%, uh, 40 to 60% activation paucity, naturally, uh, because value functions are centered around zero. And now, the second function that happens while you're training is something called activity regularization. You use that to add uh, more information to the loss function so that while training your network, you don't make the network too, uh, too uh, overfitting to the uh, training data set and you want to make it more general. The side effect of that activity, activity regularization training is that it creates more activation paucity. And as I showed you before, we benefit by uh, uh, activation paucity, uh, which this is a standard function in TensorFlow. And one of the point here is by taking the competitions into event domain, we actually are doing exactly the same number of operations that you would do otherwise in a DLA. We are not affecting any uh, accuracy or anything else. Like uh, uh, Linlet talked about uh, uh, NVIDIA doing MPL uh, architecture because they try to uh, optimize the weights and reduce, try to avoid multiplication by zeros. They might be affecting uh, the accuracy but in, in the event domain, the accuracy is not lost because we maintain everything and we're not really doing anything to your network. Here's an example of activity regularization used, and you can look at mobile net v1, where you, uh, while uh, first level of ticking into event domain reduces the event uh, competition by 55%, and there's a further improvement in activation capacity by using uh, activity regularization. But smaller network, which are doing 20 or, or, or object classification, benefit a lot more by activity regularization. In case of mobile net v1, it's running on a 20 um, object classification, where the first uh, uh, going to event domain gives you 54% reduction, while other activity regularization gives you another 24%, finally 24% uh, events have to be computed. So this really a very, uh, this is naturally benefit for our event-based competition, uh, driving low power. 
Second step we do is actually reduce the um, weight and activation to four weight. And we have done quite a few analyses that uh, you can compare to uh, uh, when you go to a lower a number of weights, you could lose a little bit of accuracy. You actually do get the accuracy back by doing uh, uh, quantization of weight training. But uh, analyzing the accuracy loss on some of the popular networks, like say mobile net v1, we're trying to do a 10, 10 object classification. Even going to four bit activation and four bit weight, you just go down like from a 30 bit floating point from 93.5 to 93.1. So this is a good trade off of a little bit of accuracy loss, but reducing the memory footprint and memory bandwidth, again, leading to low power. We have analyzed quite a bit of networks that allow this, and there's a lot of data available that show that uh, going down to four bit, four bit actually doesn't lose that much accuracy, and there's a lot of data available on that. Uh, thing. So that architecture actually is a, a first in, uh, incarnation of that is in a uh, chip for Akira 1000, AKD 1000 NSOC. This chip is available in the lab right now. We tipped it out some time back. This chip has actually in, for bringing the data into the chip, you can use USB 3.0, PCIe uh, for standard uh, frames and other standard that are coming into the chip, or you can use I2S for audio sample or I2C for sensor data. Similarly, it has an on-chip data to event converter or a frame to event converter. So we take the data and convert it into events. And then there's a neuron fabric, which has about 20 nodes on this chip that can do a complete event-based computation uh, when the weights are, can be stored on, on the fabric. If there are networks, and I'll give you an example of one of the network that weights cannot fit on the on-chip, then you can use weights from external LPDDR. The ARM processor here, which is the M4 processor that is there just to manage the, all the interface and run, do a runtime that configures the complete uh, neuron fabric it loads the weights and uh, network configuration, programs the configurability of the network. And if the network doesn't fit on the 20 node, then you can expand it to a chip-to-chip -chip communication to multiple chips. But uh, so all the complete network that is actually run on the Akira fabric. This chip is actually available. Uh, this is a 15 by 15 flip chip BGA. We have it in our lab for a couple of months now. We are testing it, it was implemented in 28 nanometer technology and both the Akira fabric and the M4 run at 300 megahertz. Um, and uh, we have boards available. This is a layout of the chip where we shows uh, the nodes, uh, regular node being uh, tiled and then uh, all the other DDR and um, M4 and USB PCIe interfaces that you see. We, are, uh, we do have uh, M.2 PCIe card also, um, a mini PCI card or other USB form factor cards that are available uh, starting next month. And some of our early access program customers will actually get those and we are working with them. Now, let me give a couple of, uh, I will talk about three examples of how uh, this uh, event domain uh, um, application uh, benefits for, uh, for analysis. We have lots of examples of standard networks already being converted and those examples are available at our website, docadventchipping.com, where you can see keyword spotting, visual record, and all the other analysis we have done. And there'll be more demos in the background, but I'm going to talk in this talk about three different uh, networks, which is the depth sensor network, which is 3D point cloud from a depth sensor uh, and a couple of somato sensation uh, vibration time series accelerometer data analysis and all factories a smell classification. For a 3D point cloud gesture classification, this is a, a, a basically you can get 3D point cloud where you get X, Y uh, coordinate and a, a Z, which is the depth of the image. And that can come from uh, this data that we have here is from our partner for Magic Eye, who actually take a CMOS image sensor and a projector that generates directly a 3D point cloud data set. We took that data set. There are about 10 subjects performing eight gestures and uh, there's a 15 second durations per sample. We actually uh, use it for four bit weights and four bit activation and train the uh, train the data from the data set. A very small network that has about 284,000 uh, parameters, uh, six layers, uh, standard three by three convolutions, 
go down from 128 by 128 and 8 bit um, resolution all the way down to a last global average pooling and a fully connected layer. And this just needs nine NPUs with the 453 kilobytes of SRAM. So the beauty of this uh, application that we're showing you is the activation sparsity in this is almost 91%. So that leads to a dynamic power of only 1.25 milliwatts if you're doing a 10 frame per second for a batch size of one. So pretty good example of a 3D point cloud where the activation sparsity and weight sparsity can be benefited by a low power hand gesture classification. The second network I want to talk about is actually olfactory classification. Here we actually have a, a Fox 3000 database, uh, which actually takes 20 chem uh, chemical compounds and they are grouped into four different groups. And the, the, uh, the gas sensor actually has 12 sensors uh, um, that are sensing the data. And the output of that is actually sampled uh, at 152 uh, hertz, where you get 150 samples. Of, uh, and we actually take the points uh, there are about 300 time points. So you can organize that data and we take the uh, values that we get from the sensors into, as, uh, we bend them into 64 different levels. There are 12 sensors and there are 300 time points. If you take all that, so we have about 230,400 uh, values that can be actually fed into a directly a, a, a network uh, which has 138 million parameters, 138 million parameters, and it's a two-layer network. What we have done is think about this as a one-bit weight and one-bit activation, and one fully connected layer. We have about 600 neurons uh, in this uh, in the fully connected layer. There are 30 neurons uh, allocated for each class, so there are 20 classes, and now, uh, from that uh, data uh, event pattern that we got, we directly encoded the, the data that we got, and we actually trained the network, a fully connected network, get a 98% of accuracy. Uh, we just need one NPU, and, but 16.5 megabytes of external RAM, LPDDR RAM, so, because we can store the, uh, store the weights there. And for a 10 frame per second kind of uh, inference, we can do it in seven milliwatts. And the neural network, by the way, is selectable by the chip runs at 300 megahertz. We can do this uh, for this network. We just have to run it at 43, mega, uh, 43 megahertz. So you control the speed at which you have to run the network and what power is there. And this is a direct example of directly in taking a time series of time series data, encoding into the spikes and running it into event domain. Uh, the third example I want to talk about was electric motor ball bearing for diagnostics. Now this is actually a case Western data set that they collected with a, a two accelerometers, looking at two different uh, uh, positions in the uh, in the machine, and uh, they actually uh, sampled the, uh, the data for three different types of faults. Uh, there are uh, uh, so there are total nine faults. There is a ball fault. There is a outer face fault. There is an inner face fault. And the ninth fault, uh, the accelerometer data will be different. And one norm is a normal class, not one of the uh, faults. So if you take that data and map it now, uh, so this was actually samples of uh, 10 classes of data with 460 samples each. The accelerometer was sampled at 48 kilohertz. And there are 1,000, uh, uh, each sample had 1,024 elements. Now we take that data and segment it into different segments of 1,024 data points. And we, if you look at the data from for the, each of the faults and try to make it into a different class, you can visualize the data. And visually you see that the patterns that you see in the data set are different between class one and class two. Okay, so that's why uh, we actually take that data set, take it to a standard uh, six layer uh, CNN, uh, total parameter is 140,000 parameters and five NPUs with 200 kilobytes of SRAM can actually do a less than a milliwatt for uh, detecting this kind of faults with a very small uh, network with a 99% of accuracy. Uh, this is again from a time series element data encoded into events and directly um, do it on a small network with very low power. So in summary, um, we actually have a very uh, 
different approach uh, to uh, inference compared to standard deep learning accelerator. We actually do event-based computation, which benefits from both activation sparsity and weight sparsity. We actually take, we have a complete uh, software uh, uh, tools that are available on our website that can allow you to convert CNN into SNN uh, through TensorFlow Chaos uh, framework. When you go down to aggressive quantization from one to four bit, you can actually do a quantization per layer and decide that uh, when you do, because you want to uh, preserve your accuracy, you can do uh, quantization away training. Uh, once the competitions are happening in, in the uh, event domain, you can learn and in, uh, have incremental learning on chip. Uh, and we have examples of those that we'll show you in the breakout room. Uh, and this can actually process uh, either the images and then we convert images into events. And I showed you that. Or you can take events directly, or you can take a time series data and encode into events uh, uh, into the network, the example that I showed. Uh, we also uh, have uh, demos in our website and our record room that will show you that will take uh, uh, dynamic vision sensor data and do gestures and other uh, applications from directly taking events or spikes from DBS sensor. So the Akira architecture is uh, actually wildly neuromorphic in principle, takes your CNN, takes it into event domain. So it's ready for today's CNN and also uh, same hardware can run uh, tomorrow's event-based uh, and uh, neural networks. And we already showed you some examples of that. We continue to uh, uh, invest in the uh, Akira architecture. Currently we're working on trying to improve our neural models and, and probably uh, have some more, more feasibility in that. And of course, uh, more features added to our neural models and also uh, uh, support new event-based algorithms in future. We'll again come back uh, to, to you uh, with those updates in the next little conference. Okay, that's my presentation, Mike. Okay, we have some time for questions, maybe. Mike? Did we lose Mike? Okay, sorry, the only time is there's a, there's a delay in the system here. Okay, no problem, yeah. Yeah, so we do have some questions. I'll just maybe start off with clarifying because, uh, you know, the, the terminology gets used for neuromorphic and spiking neural networks. Uh, yeah. This is entirely a digital design. Yes, it is completely digital design, yes. Only standard cells and memory, standard memory. And uh, we don't, we're not doing any advantage of any, any specific, uh, Process technology. It can go into any technology. Yes. You can go ahead and stop sharing your screen so we can we can see you better. Um, then, uh, question on on the activity regularization. Um, yeah. When you say feeding more information into the training process, is is that basically equivalent to pruning? Are you allowing? No, not necessarily pruning. The okay. pruning. What pruning does is it try to throw away some weights. And think about uh, throw away some connections. So, and but when you prune a network, you have to go back and retrain it. When you say activity regulation, is really the active uh, the loss function that you uh, that you uh, change to really make the uh, network more general. There are lots of paper on that, but that's what people do because what you don't want to do is you don't want to train your network. Uh, so much that it is very good at, uh, at detecting training data set, but on a testing data set, you don't want to test it on your training data set. So they want to make it more general. And that's the side effect of trying to do that, make your general more, is that's what we discovered, that it was actually increasing the activation sparsity and we benefit by sparsity, which is why we try to do that. Yeah. Does, does, it, does it impact accuracy? Uh, the, yeah, it will impact accuracy. That when you do generalization, that's what they're trying to do, not lose too much accuracy, 
And uh, yeah, that's true. Okay, so take a few more questions from the audience. Um, question on uh, the hardware cost for event-based convolution besides power, does it uh, improve performance, say reduce late, uh, latency compared to uh, uh, yes. non -event? Yeah, so latency, it does improve because depending on how many uh, NPUs did you decide to uh, are available in your chip or, or in your IP, you can distribute uh, multiple layers uh, competition on available and number of NPUs. Now, when you don't have enough NPUs, of course, you'll have to store intermediate results. So in that regard, the more hardware you throw, the, more, the less latency it will be, but you can manage that because uh, typically when you're running a DLA, you could be doing uh, one layer at a time because you have to store all the intermediate results here. Because we are doing event-based computation, we look at all the things and the events don't have to be stored. We just move on to the next layer. So multiple layers are running in parallel that actually benefits your latency and the performance. Great, thank you. Uh, we have a lot of questions, so I hope they, they <laughs> all, in the, in the break room, I'll just ask uh, one more quick one. Do you require the retraining uh, to take a neural network and run it on Akita? Uh, it only if you if you avoid because we do only do competition in four bit and four bit. So if you take a network and chop it down to four bit, if you're okay with the accuracy that accuracy loss in your application, that might be okay. But typically people people retrain it with some, what's called quantization of training to get back the accuracy loss that you might do. When you go from 8-bit to 4-bit, you are losing some information. You can gain it back by doing quantization over training. But there are actually some people are doing post-quantization, um, uh, post-training quantization on some network, and that seems to work, and we are investigating that. Okay. Well, great. It was, uh, it was an interesting uh, presentation, and uh, looking forward to your demos in the breakout room. Uh, okay. well, close this session for now and, and thank everybody for attending uh, and see you all again tomorrow morning.